Well, welcome everybody to another session in our Women Lead Online Forums brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. I'm Patty Vargas, I'm your host today. And today we have a, another resident subject matter expert in the hot seat who is actually brave enough and willing to say, go ahead, ask me anything. <laughs> now, our session today lasts for an hour, and if you've joined with video, you'll be able to see our guest and the attendees alike, and questions and comments are always welcome. If you have something that you want to ask anonymously, though, just feel free to put it in the chat to me, and I'll share it for you. So our topic today is all around pricing and how do we price our goods and services, and how do we know when we're leaving money on the table and, um, and just how do we go about doing that? And I know as a small business owner, this was one of the hardest things I ever had to come up with too. So let me tell you a little bit about our subject matter expert here. We have Rosemary Linden with us. There she is, wave your hand. Rosemary is the founder and president of Momentum CFO, a boutique firm that provides fractional CFO services to entrepreneurs. With over 20 years of financial management experience, Rosemary has developed and managed budgets exceeding $1 billion per year, served as a trusted advisor to business executives, and led finance organizations at publicly and privately held companies ranging from small startups to global Fortune 500 enterprises. Now, prior to founding Momentum CFO, Rosemary held positions including Director of Global Financial Planning and Analysis at WD40 and Vice President of Financial Planning and Analysis at Alliant Insurance Services. So, Rosemary, welcome. Tell Thank us a little you. bit more about you and let's just dive in. Yeah, so um, as you said, I worked for some big companies. I consider myself a corporate refugee. Um, I see Jai is on the call too. Jai was one of my former WD-40 co-workers. Um, so my background is 20 years in corporate finance. I left the corporate world about three years ago to start my own business, Momentum CFO. And now I offer outsourced CFO services to small to mid-sized business owners like yourselves, because a lot of entrepreneurs are great at what they do, um, specifically what they do, what their business is, but they may not have had financial training or they may not have a business background. Mm -hmm. So um, when they're small and mid-sized, they may also not have the budget to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on a CFO. And so what I do is I work with a number of different smaller companies and I may do 20 hours of work for them a month or 10 or 30, depending on what they need. So they get me part time, essentially, and then I work for a number of different companies. Um, so that's a little bit about my business. Today, as Patty said, we're going to talk about pricing and pricing is so important because you know, it really drives the revenue for your business and no revenue, no business. So um, there's a lot to think about with pricing. It is super important, but it can also be really confusing and sometimes complex. So today we're hoping to dive into some of the different ways you can price your services, you know, some pitfalls to look out for, um, things like that. So um, that's awesome. I'm so excited to hear this because, um, it's like, you know, you said no money, no business. You know, I, I think most of us go into business. Um, not intending to be a not-for-profit <laughs> entity. So if we can get this part right, then we're, you know, we're halfway there. And just to everybody who's joined us, um, I want to let you know that this is, Rosemary's got information to share. She's got, you know, a lot of tips that she's going to give you and so forth. But this is kind of an open free-for-all as well. So, you know, make sure that you, if there's something you want to say, just unmute yourself, ask your question, and, and we'll just roll with it. So, Go ahead, yes. Rosemary. Let's hear what you got to say. Yeah, so as Patty said, this is kind of informal. I'm not going to bore you with any PowerPoint presentation or anything like that. Just want to give you some tips and then obviously hear your questions and help give you some answers. So what should you think about when you're setting your pricing, right? That's the, that's the first question that we should address. And there are lots of things to consider. Um, the first thing is you really need to know your numbers and understand your costs and fully understand them. I meet a lot of business owners that think they know all about their numbers in their head, but they don't see it on paper. They haven't penciled it all out. They may be missing things when they think about their costs. And so it's really important 
to have a very good handle on what your business looks like, how profitable you are currently, and to really understand the costs of providing your product or your service. Um, and you know the costs for products versus services are different. Obviously, it can be a little bit more complicated to look at product pricing because there are so many variables in terms of you know, what costs go into producing the product? Do you have to ship it? Do you have a warehouse with overhead that you have to consider when you think about your pricing? So lots of different moving pieces there. Services can be complicated too, but a lot of us are, you know, they, we provide services maybe on an hourly basis or a project basis. We might have lower overhead than a, than a big business that has to warehouse their pro products and store them and make sure they don't spoil and, and so on. So knowing your numbers, I think that's the number one thing and probably the number one piece of advice I give to any client with any kind of financial issue is you really need to have a good starting point. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and I, I was going to ask you, Rosemary, that um, is this a common thing that a client would ask you for? I mean, is that is like maybe one of your, your biggest services that you offer? Absolutely. And I work with clients on this a lot. Um, I have a client who sells women's apparel in New York and she sells to really big department stores that you would recognize. And she came to me months ago and was ready to sell to one of these huge department stores. And we took a look at her pricing, you know, looking at the numbers very closely, like I was advising you guys to do. Um, and we took a look at how she was pricing her product and the discounts that she was going to be offering. And we found that she would have been leaving a lot of money on the table if she had gone in with this first proposal to the department store. So by really putting together um, what I would call a product profit and loss analysis, we figured out what kind of profit she would make if she went in with the current pricing. And it really was not where she wanted to be. Her profit margins were not where she would find them acceptable. So by working with her to adjust the pricing to make sure it covered all her costs, and I found that there were some that she hadn't been thinking about, um, she was able to go back to the department store, go there the first time with, with a different pricing proposal, and it turned out that the pricing that she got by selling her product to this store um, generated about a 50% higher profit margin than she would have gotten had we not done that analysis. So it can be really impactful because especially if you're selling um, something where your costs are fixed, if you're raising your price on that, it's going to, you know, that extra income is sort of dropping right to your, your profit line. I had another client who, um, he's an artist and he makes beautiful, beautiful wood pieces. Um, and he thought he was profitable, but when we actually started working together and looking at his numbers, we found that three quarters, three quarters of what he was selling was actually not profitable at all. He was losing, he would have lost money on these commissioned pieces had he gone through with them. So I advised him to let go of some of those and take a closer look at his pricing. And what we did, similarly to the client in New York, is I helped him build a calculator where every time he has a request to commission a new piece of artwork, he enters certain information in there. He knows his hourly labor rate. He knows the cost to ship his product. He knows what it costs to buy the wood or the finishing materials. And now every single time he accepts a new project, he knows it's profitable because he just uses this calculator that we worked on together. And there's no question about it. You know, he said it took the guesswork out of um, his pricing entirely and he literally said it saved his business because wow. you know he was losing money like you can't sustain a business when you're losing money on three quarters of what you're selling yeah. what is it that people sometimes don't factor in that makes it mm -hmm. such a loss what do they forget about or do they undervalue their time or what they is definitely it? undervalue their time in terms of services um i think a lot of new business owners go in and they're not super confident about what they can charge and so they tend to have maybe imposter syndrome thinking oh you know this is this is too much and they do tend to undercharge um, they may not have thought about you know, how they really value their own time. And again, all their overhead components, what those are and factoring those in. 
Um, so it can be complicated for service owners as well as, as companies that sell products. Did I answer your question? Yeah, that was great. I want to hear from the rest of you guys though too. So, you know, make, this isn't just a conversation between <laughs> me and Rosemary, although I'm think, loving it. <laughs> yeah, I think one thing I would add, you know, some things that overlook, that are overlooked, it really depends on which industry you're in as well. Um, I may start working with a client soon who sells juices and food products. And while she understands what her costs are right now, she hasn't in the past taken into account things like some of those products are gonna spoil because they're perishable. And so if she has spoilage or bottles that are breaking and she didn't sort of factor some of that into her pricing, she may wind up losing out. So there are things that are very specific to the industry that you're in that you may have to consider, um, like spoilage in a food industry that can really cause problems if you know there's too much of that going on and that has there haven't been any assumptions made to say, okay, maybe we're gonna lose 5% of the products that we try to ship to these grocery stores. Okay, so I have a question. Uh -huh. So, um, in, in my world, it's um, very common uh, for any interior designer to be like super busy with three projects all at once and you're working full time. So you, you are billing that hourly rate at like 40, 50 hours a week. And then you have two months where you, you, know, you, you don't have any and you, something is not starting for two months or whatever. So it's not as easy to say, oh, I need to make X an hour Mm -hmm. in order to because I, I do know what my overhead costs are and I do chart you know in, in if it's a bigger project there might be some markup that I do mm -hmm. um, but the, it's hard to figure out the whole hourly because sometimes I charge an hourly rate because it's a bigger project and I do like retainers 20 hours mm -hmm. at a time or sometimes I do a flat fee and it's just hard to make sure that you're covered and that you are getting enough income when the, the, the actual projects are so sporadic and not like even every single week. So right, and so that's that. even a little bit of, of a cash flow question too, because you're saying you have you know, ups and downs and, and when your revenue is coming in and you may have some really good months and some months that are, mm -hmm. that are down a bit. And so you have to look at the whole year as a big picture and, and sort of plan ahead for perhaps those months where you're not gonna do as much business. Um, but what you're referring to is kind of one of the most common forms of pricing or pricing strategies, but it's not the only one. So I think what you're doing is you're doing essentially what's called cost plus pricing, mm -hmm. right? Definitely. You're figuring out what your costs are and you're adding a certain markup to compensate you for the, the wages you want to earn and the profit that you want to make. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of different ways to do cost plus pricing. You can do what you're doing, as you said, hourly. You can charge by the project, which sometimes is based on a rough estimate of hourly. Mm -hmm. um, you can charge a retainer fee where you're billing the client month over month for the same amount. That's what I do primarily with my services. Um, you know, I have clients that stay with me for quite a while, so they have a flat fee that they pay every month. Um, there are other ways of pricing that are cost plus as well. Um, they're just completely different strategies like value-based pricing, for instance. So in that case, you're not thinking just about your costs, but you're thinking about the value that you bring to the client. Mm -hmm. So let me give you an example. Um, if I help a client increase their, if I do something in two or three hours that helps increase the client's profitability by $50,000, it may not be the smartest thing for me to charge them for two or three hours of my time, right? Mm -hmm. So I have to think more about the value that I'm bringing to that customer and what that project may be worth to them. And so that I'm not, not only charging them fairly, but thinking about compensating myself fairly as well. Mm -hmm. So in your case, Ganilli, I mean, you could think about value-based pricing, like how are you actually helping that client? What additional value are you bringing? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think you serve kind of higher end clients as well, don't you? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's what I'm working for some mm -hmm. the area. So that this, that because that's the fastest growing segment of the short term rental industry is the luxury market. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting thing because 
what I do, the, the, what I do is help my clients maximize their rental value. Right. So once I'm done, they should, I mean, it depends on obviously what budget they have and what they're willing to invest. Mm-hmm. But it tends to be somewhere around 10 to 25% increase in rental rate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you brought up something too. You said luxury, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Another pricing strategy is kind of a luxury pricing strategy. When you think about your brand and what the value of your brand is. Mm-hmm. So if you think about some place like, you know, Louis Vuitton or Tiffany Um, Or even I'm about to remodel a kitchen and I've been looking at high-end appliances and I recently found that high-end appliances, they really, it doesn't really pay to go price shop around at a bunch of stores because they don't discount, you know, they, they are a luxury brand and they want to set their prices accordingly and they're not going to keep discounting because that sort of devalues the, the luxury aspect of their brand. Um, so a lot of, you know, a lot of businesses don't use just this cost plus pricing. They may be thinking about value based pricing. They may be thinking, Hey, we're a luxury brand and we're going to charge luxury prices for that. Um, in some cases, especially if you're a new business owner, you may be trying to penetrate the market, you know, gain market share. And you might consider doing something like looking at your competitors and then pricing slightly lower than they are to try to steal some of the market share away from them. So there are a whole bunch of different strategies for pricing. I think for the most part, you know, people want to obviously profit, certainly in the long term. Um, If you go in with your prices low to try to gain market share, you can't sustain that forever, right? At some point, you're going to have to to increase your prices and having worked for some big companies, WD-40 being one of them, I remember going through price increase analyses and having to communicate those those increases to the customer and no customer wants to hear about a price increase, right? Mm -hmm. So you wanna, I mean, pricing is an iterative process where you have to try some things out, see if it works, maybe make some adjustments, but you really don't wanna have to be going to your same customer again and again and saying, okay, I'm going to increase my price 5%. Oh, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it again. That doesn't leave a good taste in their mouth. Mm-hmm. Right. right. Yeah. Hi, this is Jaya. And I was... Hi, Jaya. Question. Um, so this is more of a comment, really, but um, the, the whole thing about what value you're adding and pricing based on that is so important. Mm-hmm because it's ultimately like in longer term, what do you, what are you giving and how do you price? Because if you don't price it, but, but part of that is also knowing who your target is, right? right. Being Absolutely. clear about your target. So if your target is very mixed or if you're not clear on that, that becomes a problem. Yes. So luxury pricing, but you're actually targeting, you know, the non-luxury customers, then you might price yourself out of the market in the longer term. Right. So, if you're a new business owner, what, what kind of ideas do you have about making sure you're, you're pricing correctly to the right target? Would you say you have two different brands? I mean, it's not feasible, but do you have two different brands and say that, okay, I'm going to sell you the Cadillac and I'm going to sell you the Prius or how do you do that? Yeah. So I think you kind of brought up something earlier. You really have to know your customer, right? What does your customer look like? Um, you know, are you selling something that's a luxury brand? Are you going to offer different levels of pricing? So for instance, in my business, I have kind of a full service fractional CFO package where you're going to be retaining me for a good deal of time every month. But I also have kind of a lower level package that doesn't cost as much for smaller businesses. So you really have to understand who your buyer is, you know, what the price points they may be looking for are. And importantly, you know, looking at the marketplace and looking at what other um, businesses in your industry do, how do they price? I mean, if you're something like a yoga studio, um, that would be very easy to go on your competitors' websites and look at what they're charging. And that doesn't mean you should still ignore um, what your own costs are. You have to still know those very well but that would at least give you information about what your competitors are doing. And that could, that could be the basis for some of your thoughts on pricing. 
Um, but industries, you know, it varies by industry. Some industries have very slim profit margins and other ones have really big ones commonly. So if you're in an industry with a slim profit margin, maybe it's on average 10% and you're trying to get a profit margin of 50%, you're probably not going to have very many customers. So there's a trade-off kind of between your pricing and maybe the volume of business that you're going to get. You know, if you price too high, um, the demand for your product is going to be lower. And that, that's kind of getting into what's called um, price elasticity. So think about this, you know, some products you can change the price and people are still going to buy it. Maybe like things like milk or eggs, things that you need to have at home. If the price changes a little bit, you're probably still going to buy the milk and you're still going to buy the eggs. Um, but if something like jewelry changes greatly, you might say, you know, I can do without that piece of jewelry. Um, so when you're changing your pricing, one of the most important things to do is make sure that you monitor the impact of that and maybe start with some small changes first to test it out. Um, because you don't want to go in with your pricing way too high, then you're not going to have any customers buying, your volume's going to be very low. But conversely, if you go in too low, um, and if you're, for instance, a service business and you go in too low and you have every single prospect saying, yes, 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 I want your service, that might be a clue to you that you're underpricing, you know, because there, there are always going to be prospects that say no, because that's out of reach. Does that make sense? So being yeah. clear about your industry, the market, the customer you're serving, and, and again, your goals, you know, what is your goal? Is it to be the loss leader at first, just so you can gain your market share or is it to be profitable from the outset? Well, another thing that I actually heard recently, which I thought was very interesting and a very interesting perspective um, was that if you, if you are unable to clearly, I think Jaya was talking about this, about um, if you can't clearly, um, express the value, a unique yes. value proposition, as opposed to a unique selling proposition, because mm -hmm. anybody can, well, not anybody, but selling is not the same as value. You can't say that what you are bringing to the table that is unique, that is going to help them solve. A, a prospective client or customer is always, 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 always going to base their decision on pricing. Mm -hmm. So that if you bring a unique value that, that even, you know, if they do have the budget and they're w within the budget of being able to do something with you, then they're, they're like, well, wow, you know, she or he can do this. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that I've, that we've spoken to other, you know, I don't know, whatever service that it is that you offer. So I thought that that was an interesting perspective. Definitely. Yeah. That's a good point. Thank you for making that. Um, you, you're right. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, could you speak to um, someone who, the, the, well, I'll, I'll give you just from a personal example. Back when I was very first starting my business, one of the projects I had was to develop a training curriculum for this company. Mm -hmm. And and it was going to earn them residual money forever and ever and ever and ever and right. ever until it was obsolete. And I didn't have any idea how to charge for it. And so what kind of made me think of that was when you're talking about the value they're going to derive from the product you give them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I did some, you know, lame ass way of pricing it, you know, like based on the hours it took me to make it or something mm -hmm. like that. But I never, you know, then I had like this kind of feeling of bitterness afterwards when I saw yeah. them continue to use my product over and over and over again, sure. making money, charging people a lot of money to you know, go through their curriculum and so forth. So what, what would you tell someone, you know, if I were to do that again, right. what, what's a better way of doing that? Right. So it sounds like you felt a little bit short changed, right? Mm -hmm. Because you put all this work into it and then you saw them reap the benefits, not just one time, but on a really ongoing basis and yeah. thought to yourself, well, I only charged them X, but they're getting X times 30 mm -hmm. in value. Yeah, um, exactly. So, yeah, value based pricing is one way to go on that to think more about, you know, what they're going to gain from it. And when I'm talking to prospects on the phone, I always kind of try to elicit from them 
what value they think they're going to get from working with me, you know, whether it's tangible or intangible. But in a case like what you're, what you're talking about, I mean, you could consider something like a pay per, per, per uh, pay for performance sort of scheme where perhaps you take a percentage of that, you know, recurring revenue stream or increased profit or whatever it was so that you are being paid more for the value that you bring to them and not just that work that you did the one time. So you can be creative with pricing. I mean, you don't have to box yourself into I'm going to charge an hourly rate or I'm going to charge a project rate. There are lots of ways to do it. It certainly depends on who the customer is um, and, and what kind of pricing they can afford. Um, you know, right now, if I try to work with cash strapped small businesses, having them pay me a monthly fee is really difficult because they don't have a cash, you know, the cash flow to do it. So sometimes you could consider like deferring payment until they reach a certain mile post or, you know, charging them kind of like you're, you're saying, you know, based on the value that you bring them, you know, once that their profit increases to a certain goal amount or increases X percent over what it was when you started working with them, maybe you take a little percentage of that. Um, so lots of different ways to do it. I mean, it's certainly specific to everyone's business and industry and client demographic. Make sense? Thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. I wish I knew you then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so some other things like what, what consequences occur if you misprice your products and services, right? If you underprice them, then you're leaving money on the table and you may have a whole lot of volume, but like Patty, you may be feeling like, man, I kind of missed out, right? And then if you overprice them, people may not be buying and then you're not, you don't have enough revenue there. So it's kind of like a Goldilocks situation where you have to get it kind of just right, right? And that's hard to do. I mean, even when you're working with a financial professional like myself that has done this before, there is a little bit of trial and error. And so one of the really important things I think is to monitor what happens after you implement that pricing, like, you know, figure out, and maybe you guys, I don't know if you would do this on your own, but you know, look at the elasticity of demand. Is your demand changing a lot because you changed your prices or has it stayed the same? If it stayed the same, great. You know, that's, that's awesome. But, but you may have to adjust a little bit. So you, you want to really keep track of your numbers and keep track of things like if you're selling a whole bunch of different products at different price points, maybe what the average selling price is per product. Um, you have to think about things like discounting and not discounting your products too much, which business owners that are new tend to do a lot. You know, hey, my price is this, but I'm going to take 20% off because you're my friend kind of thing, which isn't wrong to do in some cases, but you can't do it forever because um, you're, you're giving your value away there. Well, how about the rest of you out there? I'm sure you've got questions. I'm sure, uh, well, I, at least I hope that I'm not the only one on the call <laughs> who's, who's made a bonehead pricing mistake <laughs> no, in the past. No, not bonehead. I mean, it's, it's complicated. There's so many things to consider. Yeah. Well, and, and I was, like I said, I was new. It was one of my very first jobs, you know, out of the gate as a, as a consultant and just didn't, it never entered my mind. I, I still had the employee mindset. You mm -hmm. know, I had just, I was a brand new consultant. So I still had this employee mindset that I'm, you know, I'm working for the hour and, and this product belongs to them because they paid me to develop it. And, mm -hmm. and there is some truth to that, but um, what I should have done was exactly like you said, I should have some sort of a residual royalties kind of thing, you know, that went on afterwards every time they sold it, turned around and sold it again. Yeah. 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 And if you can elicit from your client, like on a prospect call, what the value may be, you know, maybe you know, for instance, that the work you're going to do is going to generate them a hundred thousand dollars of additional profit. Then again, kind of go back to that thought of let's not charge them by the hour because you know it's, it's just worth a lot more than that. 
And there are all sorts of pricing strategies that we haven't even talked about, but exist in the marketplace, like dynamic pricing is a really interesting one. I mean, think about Uber, for instance, right? You know, if you want to take a trip at a certain time of day, you're going to pay more than at another time of day. Or even with utilities sometimes, like your energy usage, especially in San Diego, you know, don't run your air conditioning too much if you, if you keep it set at kind of a a lower setting where it's not running as much, you might get some rebates from SDG&E um, just because you're not running as much at peak time. So lots of different pricing strategies out there. I think the most common one though that, that most people wanna talk about is sort of this um, cost plus pricing where you're, you're figuring out your costs and going from there. So what is a good formula if you're doing cost plus or does that also vary you know, industry to industry or service to service? Yeah, I mean, I think the number one key thing is that you have to know all of your costs, right? You know, think about every aspect of what it takes to produce your product or service, not just the obvious ones like, you know, I make a widget and I need component A, B, and C to put that widget together. I also probably employ people that put that together. I may store um, the inventory in a warehouse. I may have to store the parts that go into creating that widget in a warehouse. Um, you obviously have to pay yourself. You have overhead costs for the warehouse. You may have a home office or another office that you have to think about. So it's really looking at all the costs that you would see on an income statement or a profit and loss statement from your cost of goods sold to the rest of your, your operating expenses. I mean, if, if you're a service provider and you have to travel to see a client a lot, um, you know, perhaps you're charging that client directly for your travel costs or just passing them on, that makes it simple. Um, but you know, in other cases, maybe if you're just driving to a client site to meet with them for an hour or two, you have to think about, well, hey, you're gonna spend an hour in the car getting there, right? So, so what is, how does that affect your pricing? So, I mean, I don't know that there's a magic formula, except the basic formula is definitely have a great handle on all of your costs, what those look like, and then figure out, you know, how to make sure that you're covering those costs and earning the profit margin that you want to earn within reason for the market that you're in and the industry that you're in. You can't go way out of bounds of what everyone else that's similar to you is doing or you're not going to, they're going to go to the competitor. Granilla said something about, um, you know, customers look for price. And I think certainly price is maybe one of the biggest factors that they look at, but they also do look at value. You know, think about how you make choices between, you know, even hiring someone to do something for your home. You know, maybe, um, I don't yeah, know. Usually a red flag for me is when some, the very first question they ask me is how much is this going to cost? Yes. And that yes. is like asking how long is a piece of string because mm -hmm. what, you know, we haven't even talked scope. We haven't even talked about what you're potentially interested. Right. So that to me is usually a red flag because that, that, you know, then, then we're already talking to somebody who is going to base their decisions on pricing and, and, and even if you actually communicate the value that you bring, Mm -hmm. They're still like, yeah, I just, you know, so, so there are definitely those potential clients and, and, you know, I just don't, I don't onboard those kinds of clients. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And there are kind of two different schools of thought too, about whether you advertise your prices, you know, depending on what you provide, like for you, Ganilla, um, you know, do you put your prices on your website so that you automatically weed out people that are going to say, no, that's way too much. And then you haven't spent time with them. I actually, yeah, I actually got a, a recommendation from, um, I follow two, two women who are interior designers who actually are coaching other de interior designers of how to run a profitable business. And one of them was talking about, uh, it's, it's sometimes a very good idea to put on your website that you have a project minimum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that way you weed out any, anybody who, who's like, whoa, okay, that's not, you know, where I need to be. But I think the key point there, too, is being able to convey the value, right? You know, like you said, if the first question someone asks you is, well, what are you going to charge? I mean, there's much more 
of um, a more complex answer than you know X dollars per hour to that. It's like, well, what what are we doing, and and what kind of results are we expecting to get? And do you think that you know now that I'm going to tell you the price, and we've talked about the results and the value that's going to result from our work together, then it starts to seem you know very fair in a lot of cases to to customers that may have come in with just this idea of I'm not going to pay more than X. Then they realize that they're investing in something that's going to mm -hmm. generate a return for them in some way and it is worth more than just x dollars per hour yeah and that's why i have like an onboarding process which i talked a little bit about yesterday in the conference mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. asking open-ended questions that that t tells me a lot about where they're at and what they're thinking and what they're hoping to accomplish mm -hmm. Yeah. And I found even in my own business that I like to give clients options. I think Jaya kind of mentioned that earlier, where I won't present them just one option. I'll give them maybe, I give them two always, possibly three, depending on, on what they're looking for. And that's another way of trying to capture more sales, right? Because you're not giving them just one option. And I'm not saying, you know, sell your same exact product for three different prices. That's not what I'm saying at all. But like in my business, um, you know, I may be working half of a week for one client um, and maybe they don't need me that much. So I might offer them different levels of service in terms of the time commitment that I'm giving them so that if they're not ready for kind of the full service package, they can use me more as like a financial coach or a mentor where I may be meeting with them and answering their questions every week and being that sounding board for them, maybe doing some work in the background to help them out, but I'm not gonna be doing very extensive work like modeling what their financial performance might look like for the next two years. They're not ready for that, they may not be able to afford that, so I give them kind of different options of the kind of service package that they can choose with me, and then it's not just a black or white yes or no, it's, hey, well maybe this is a better fit for me than this other this other um, way that we can work together. And that also allows maybe a small business owner to grow with you too, mm -hmm. as, they're, sure. as they grow. Hey, uh, Lori, I think you had a question. Can you unmute or not unmute? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I, my, my business is uh, really unique. And it is so I know the consulting end of it, I, I agree with everything Manila said in terms of you know, trying to figure out your value and pricing and that. But I do promotional products, so I'm a distributor. So I deal with suppliers. So that, uh, so I have a couple questions, but um, I can spend many hours, many days pulling together ideas for a client. Mm -hmm. uh, that I have the hardest time kind of many times doesn't even turn into a, we all have that, you know, you spend so much time giving ideas and selling that doesn't feed to the bottom line because you're not getting paid. And ultimately I might get the business, but many times no. Yeah. And, and the challenge is like you said, dealing with small businesses or small to medium businesses, they don't have like, right? I'm sorry, some, I think, did, did you cut out for other people? I missed some of what you said there. Oh, um, okay. Maybe the so, last 15 seconds or so. Okay, <laughs> so um, it's a challenge pricing, not, mm -hmm. and not pricing yourself out of the business. Right. But the, but the question I have for you in terms of what you do, one of the challenges I have is my price is variable. It's so, it's you know, very what? I'm sorry, your price is very based it varies based on quantity. Got it. Okay. So they buy the same exact product and they buy a hundred. Got you know, it. A certain price. If they buy, you know, five hundred, it's a different price. So so volume um, discounts. Yes, exactly. Uh -huh. So do you do you help clients set it up like in terms I'm missing you again. Yeah, Lori, something's going on. Kind of you, connection there. Yeah, let me. Put yeah, we can't. We can't hear you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, she cuts in and out a little bit there. So, <laughs> trying to answer her question. Yeah, but it's an inter It's an interesting thing about um, uh, volume 
pricing. Let's see how it does with her headset on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't even know what fun. It's interesting. That okay. Is it better? Let's try. Let now it's still cutting in and out. Okay. John, how much? How much they sell? Yeah. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Go ahead and try one more time, Lori. Let's see. Technical problems. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why my system keeps telling me I have low resources, but I closed. Well, so Lori, don't why why don't you um, type it in the chat box and I'll ask it for you. In the meantime, Susan's asked a question okay. um, about bartering, and mm. Susan, I I wanted to kind of get this out there. Um, she teaches flute and piano and would like to teach more homeschool students. However, the finances are often very tight, so bartering is one option. Can you speak to that about bartering? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a way that, especially when you're starting out, you could kind of swap services. I mean, maybe someone has something of value to you. They offer, they're an expert in an area that you're not in, that you're not an expert in, and you can kind of trade services. I think one of the important things to think about, though, is you can do that here and there, but if you need to generate income for yourself to you know, put food on the table or pay the rent or the mortgage, bartering is not necessarily going to you know, work out for you well in that situation. So I, I mean, I think it's okay to do here and there, but you know, unless you're completely financially independent, um, then I think it's not a great long-term strategy because you're not generating the actual income you need to sustain yourself and your business. Um, but I think part of that is to like thinking about, you know, who your client is. And it sounds like you've got, you know, some clients that just can't afford what you would normally offer. Um, is there a way that you could provide, you know, fewer hours of lessons or how could you, maybe change the, the way you offer your services to make it more affordable for those, those people. I don't know if that's possible. You know, if you're giving flute lessons, for instance, you might always need to, to meet with that student for an hour every week. Um, not as familiar with that industry, but does that answer your question about bartering? Got lots of mutes here. Got to look for that chat. There we go. I don't see any response there. Maybe you yeah, she to... yeah she said they they um it it answers her question yeah okay so. got it mm -hmm. yeah that is a unique one that's a that's a unique question I think maybe um another option might be not necessarily to, to solve that particular situation but um like someone who can't afford one on one coaching maybe mm -hmm. they can afford group coaching exactly. you know there's a, a cheaper price by bringing people together and not cheaper a reduced price or a, right. a more uh, competitive price absolutely I see coaches do that a lot for for various things where you know some people want one-on-one -on -one private coaching with them but other people either don't want that or can't afford it and so you going back to kind of my comment about can you change your service offering a little bit you know could you do a group workshop that would be you know, you'd still earn income, but you're you're dealing with everyone all at once rather than one on one. Um, could you record some kind of workshop that would give you more passive income if you then posted that on your website and charged, you know, a fee for attendance? Um, you know, maybe think about ways that you can package up your your services differently so that they would suit the needs of different types of individuals. Can I um, chime in on that subject? Yes, of course. Exactly my business model. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. Tell us I'm about it. I'm a leadership trainer and um, I started out doing a lot of public classes and I have moved into private coaching and um, I have different tiers. Mm -hmm. So if somebody says they can't afford me, I then move them into a self-worth class right. <laughs> at like 22 bucks and I bring the self-worth up and then they can move on to, you know, my sessions are 250 an hour. Mm -hmm. And if they can't do that, if they can get themselves there, then they move up to out of the group into a group coaching and then they move private 
And so my value ladder starts at 22 and goes all the way up to 20,000. So mm -hmm. I have somewhere for everybody to fit into that bracket. Um, so that way I can serve them and get them from where they are to where they want to go. And some of them, it just takes a little bit longer and they're bigger steps. Mm -hmm. So um, it was a hard lesson to learn um, for myself because I, and I started like giving too much of myself away. Yeah. But then I was, then when I did my books, I was like, mm -hmm. oh, hell no. <laughs> this yeah. is not happening anymore. So that's when I created that value letter. And then I don't lose anybody. Right. Because you're kind offering of like them you different said, levels. About getting them to fit in, you know, whether I can't wait to have you uh, doing my numbers. <laughs> so I'm probably going to have to do the value letter with you, right? And right. work it in. So. For me, that was an important um, assessment. I had to know my numbers. I had to know my cost and value my time and times my value my time by like three to make it to where I'm not stressed out. Right. Well, right. it sounds like you've really figured it out and that's fantastic that you have all those different levels of service um, because I think a lot of people that, that do, their, that set their pricing similar to how you've done it find that you know the client that comes in at the lowest level by working with them you know at some period of time later they may be ready for that next step on your value ladder and so it's it's often worthwhile to try to bring in those clients and have different levels of service for them so they can move up the ladder so to speak as as you as you said yeah ben. and i kind of start myself at the 500 dollar mark Mm -hmm. And if they can't afford to come in and do a group training uh -huh. at 500, I'll then bring them down slowly. But Got then it. they always want the group. So they immediately start to evolve up. Mm -hmm. And then you know, once they get with what I'm teaching and they feel the um, instantaneous results and the upgrades in their life and their head, yeah. much, it's, it, it almost becomes their new addiction. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I highly recommend if you can do that, then you don't lose a client. And believe right. me, you had to walk over burning coals and eat crow a lot and have some <laughs> humble pie and, and could, you know, big ugly cries and all of it. I went through all of it to get to, to get to that point. And I think that's important too, is everybody kind of needs to go through the school of hard knocks for a second mm -hmm. to figure out what is best suited for them. Because right. you're not going to know until it hurts really bad that it doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Learn so, from your Thank you for letting mistakes. me share. I'm so happy to be on here with all of you and to meet you. Hi, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> I met Lori and Patty yesterday. Yeah. Oh, great. I yeah. must have missed you yesterday. I wasn't at the event. I just happened oh. to be meeting uh, one of my colleagues, Ava, for dinner at the hotel because she was down from L.A., and then uh -huh. I ended up at the table with all these wonderful ladies last night. Oh, nice. So it was super cool. So I'm plugging myself in, checking out the community. And so far, I'm just, uh, I'll see you on the 14th. And I'm hoping to fill out an application. So super. That's you all great. have a blessed day. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So Thank you for I, your time, too. You have such great advice. Thank you. Yeah. I do. I have Lori's question here for you, Rosemary. So okay. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, yeah, let's see. So she said, um, just wanting to know if she provides help in setting up the best, most effective way to track and manage my promotional product quantity pricing. I currently use spreadsheets, spreadsheets to set up my quantity pricing and then enter the item in QuickBooks after the client decides what they want to buy. Is that too low a service for, for the level of service you provide? Or do you recommend a QuickBooks or CPA service if it is you know, below what you would get involved in? Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're doing sort of data entry into QuickBooks, that might be more of um, a bookkeeper role. I could certainly I partner with different bookkeepers that could help you with that. Um, I don't typically do that kind of work. There are other ways that you can automate things a little bit with QuickBooks so that you're not doing it one by one, but you can like upload a spreadsheet or upload a, a bigger quantity of data. Um, some of the tools that I offer for things like that are, I wish I could show you an example right now, but I don't think I have one prepared that's not a confidential client one, um, is I have, have you heard of dashboards? 
by any chance? Okay, so a dashboard is sort of a visual representation of your data. It could be sales trends, it could be key metrics that you're tracking. And so for those of you that don't wanna stare at a spreadsheet or don't love Excel as much as I do, <laughs> um, I have some <laughs> really cool interactive dashboarding tools where we can take tons of data from nearly any source. It can even be something like Twitter where we're looking at the types of comments that people are making. Um, but we can suck in all that sales data into this dashboard, which really has a big database behind it, and look at things like trending. You know, if you changed the price of your products a certain amount, you know, what has happened over time after you did that? Um, what is the average selling price of your products if you're offering discounts at certain times of year? So yeah, there are a lot of different ways that we can track it. Um, if you need you know, some help with QuickBooks, feel free to shoot me an email or give me a call and I can send you somebody. If you wanna explore different options with me, um, I do offer free consultations so we could dig into your specifics a little bit more and see how I might be able to help you. Quick, quick question. Mm -hmm. Do you know bookkeepers who do studio designer? Um, studio, just like just your type of industry. Well, or? so yeah, so so basically, there is a pro, there's a software called, well, this is not a software; it's an online, you know, software. So it does project management as well as the accounting part of it. So hmm. people do zero on QuickBooks, and that's the most. Oh, right. But this this is specifically a, a you know accounting bookkeeping portion. So I was just wondering if you knew anyone. I don't know with that particular platform, but certainly a lot of bookkeepers have different apps that are connected to QuickBooks that they may be familiar with. And that may be, you know, one that, that someone can help you with. You just have to ask that question. And I think just this is sort of a side note on bookkeepers. Um, just a word of advice. I have found it really difficult to find good bookkeepers. Um, I, I see a lot of scary things when I start working with clients and I think a big mistake where people go wrong not knowing this is that when you're looking for a bookkeeper, you really want to know that that person has some kind of accounting background, you know, understands the language of accounting. What you see often is you'll see, you know, a QuickBooks Pro certification, you know, they'll say I'm QuickBooks Pro certified and that's great. That means they know how to use the QuickBooks software very well and they may very well have an accounting background. I mean, this is not every bookkeeper, but I have come across quite a few that have a QuickBooks Pro certification, but they really don't understand accounting. And so that's a key thing to look for. You know, if you're looking for a new bookkeeper, ask them about their background. Did they get an accounting degree? Did they do some kind of certificate program on the side? Because if you're just going for someone that knows how to use QuickBooks, you may find yourself with some issues when it comes to tax time or really being able to, to analyze your numbers if they're not being kept properly. You know, Rosemary, as we um, come to the, you know, coming down to the end of our hour together, can you say a little bit more about like how do we value our own time? You know, I, I, I think um, we feel guilty. That's too much money. Um, I'm not worth that. What, you know, what, what all those lies are that go through our heads and so forth. But what would you say to that? Imposter syndrome, right? You know, like I'm not good enough. I shouldn't charge that much. Um, I've seen this post flying around LinkedIn a lot lately, and I'm, I'm going to get the specific wording wrong, but it's something like, you know, if it only takes me an hour to do something, it's because I have 20 years of experience doing that thing, right? So I think we, we really need to keep in mind our own career, our professional development, like what has led us to where we are today? You know, have you been in business for 20, 30 years? Do you have additional graduate degrees or certifications? Um, you really have to value yourself, you know, it's self-worth too, of, you know, not only your credentials, but that you have something valuable to offer your customers and you're not going to give it away for free. Um, so that's hard to overcome sometimes. Um, but I think if you have a supportive community of, of women or men and women that you can also bounce your ideas off of, that helps a lot too. You know, if you have your own inner circle group or your own little personal board of directors where you can say, hey, you know, I'm, 
I'm feeling kind of not so confident today. This is why um, I've personally found it really helpful to have a group of women that I can say, hey, this is how I'm feeling today, or I'm just not confident about this. And they can sort of lift me up a little bit and remind me, no, you know, you, you worked really hard to get to this point and you should value your, your services appropriately. That's a hard one though. I think so many people struggle with that. Yeah, I, our um, accountant, when we lived in San Diego, she had done our taxes for years and years and she had a sign above her door that said, um, you're paying me for my 35 years worth of experience. Right. And so clearly she had been, you know, questioned on that a few times. And that's where, you know, get back to Gunilla's comment about, you know, pricing and value. I mean, you would expect to pay an experienced CPA or an experienced attorney that's been doing this for 30 years more than someone that maybe just passed their CPA exam. Um, so of course price is important, but it's the value and the expertise that someone brings as well and, and what you're gonna get from them, what kind of value um, is gonna result from working with that person. Yeah. Well, Rosemary, this has been awesome. And the questions that you all have asked have just been great and, and sharing your experiences and so forth with one another. That's what I love about these forums. That's, that's the value of them, right? So any last things that you would like to share with us, Rosemary, before we wrap up? Um, well, thank you all for being here. I think you've had some great questions and I hope this has been helpful. Um, if you do have specifics about your own business that you, you feel like you need some help with pricing or something similar, um, feel free to reach out to me directly or you can just go to my website, which is MomentumCFO.com and I do offer free consultations, so there's no obligation, but we can just chat about whatever your needs are and, and see if it makes sense for us to work together if you do need help with something like pricing. That is great. Well, thank you again, everybody, for joining us. And I, again, want to thank Rosemary. This, was, this clearly was um, a topic that needed discussing. Um, so again, thanks for this. This was wonderful. Um, one, one of the comments in the chats is this was priceless. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> so that's great. Yeah. So, you know, stay tuned, um, watch uh, the website, watch the newsletters, watch Facebook and LinkedIn for our next upcoming events. We've got a number of these online forums that come up and they're designed to keep us in the know and keep the conversations going. So I'm looking forward to the very next time that we're all together and um, I will see you soon. So take care, everybody. Have a wonderful Thank rest you. of your day. Thanks Bye. So much. Bye.